Deshmukh is a Konya consultant in LUPI Hyderabad. She has many publications to her uh, credit and uh, she's worked with Dr. Dua. Uh, she's done a clinical research fellowship with Dr. Dua in the University of Nottingham. Um, due to unavoidable circumstances, I think Dr. Soham Basak was not able to make uh, to this session. So she'll be covering uh, his topic as well. So she'll first uh, start off with corneal topography. Yeah, so I'll first start with corneal topography and then I'll cover some of the dry Yeah, a little bit of... Yeah. Uh, whenever the time is exceeding, yeah. you can just let me know, ma'am. She has a half now. Okay. Hey, no, yeah. She has a speaker. She has a more speaker. She's covering that. Okay. Yeah, so today first I'll be talking about corneal topography essentials uh, in the next 15 to 20 minutes. First thing to understand is what is the difference between topography and tomography. So topography is a two-dimensional representation of the corneal surface. But tomography takes into account a three-dimensional image. So it is also going to take into account the posterior surface of the cornea and the thickness of the cornea and the relation between the anterior and the posterior curvature. So that is what is tomography. So what are the different techniques that are available for topography? First is the placebo-based system, such as the photokeratoscope or video keratoscope, which were in vogue earlier. It is mainly based on uh, reflection of a placebo disc system on the tear film, and then the reflection of the placebo image is what is measured. Second is slit scanning system, which is mainly used by OPSCAN. So in slit scanning system, it is uh, based on uh, analyzing the parallelopiped image like we do in a slit lamp. That is why it is called a slit scan. So there are several slits which are sent from uh, medial to lateral and back and forth. And then the anterior and the posterior curvature of the cornea is measured. And last is the shine flux system, which is used by Pentacam, Galilei, and Sirius. So what is a placebo-based topography? Placido image and placido rings are projected on the anterior surface of the cornea, and the reflected image is captured from the tear film. And topographic data is calculated from the distance between the rings, and then it is represented in the form of a color-coded image. So there are certain disadvantages of a placido system. First of all, because it is just a reflection-based topography, the posterior surface of the cornea is not taken into account. So it's only the anterior surface which is taken into account. Secondly, the central and the paracentral cornea is not fully covered like we are seeing in this particular image. So we get a very good data from the central cornea which reflects very well. But if there are any shadows like of the lid margin or the eyelashes, then the peripheral data is not taken. And then small degrees of abnormalities are not identifiable in a placido ring because the distance between the rings is what is going to calculate your keratometry values. The curvature is derived. It is not a directly measured uh, keratometry value. It is always derived using an algorithm. And lastly, we need a healthy ocular surface for a good image to be captured. So if there is a patient whose ocular surface is not healthy, then it is very difficult to get a good topography image. Next is slit scanning elevation topography, which is used in orb scan. So like I mentioned, it, is, it combines a projection of the slit of the light. So it is the same principle as a slit lamp and with the reflection of a placebo disc as well. So it combines your slit scan and your placebo disc. A combination of the two gives you the anterior and posterior surfaces of the cornea. And that is why it comes under tom tomography. Now, op scans are, there are different types. First was the op scan one, which was the first attempt at the study of posterior surface. Then came op scan two, which also incorporated the placebo disc in the slit scanning system. And now there is an op scan 2Z, which also has a aberrometer included in the topography. Then Scheimflug principle. So Scheimflug principle basically is that uh, what it says is if the plane of the object is not parallel to the plane of the film, then the depth of focus is better. That is the entire principle on which the Scheimflug image works. And Scheimflug imaging is essentially a tomographic imaging. So it will take your uh, corneal thickness, anterior surface, and posterior surface, and the relation between the two surfaces together. And how are these topography maps represented using the 
color coded system called as Louisiana State University color, color coded system. That is the standardized one in which usually the cool colors uh, correspond to flatter curvatures and the warmer colors will be towards the steep, steeper curvatures. So this is an example. If we look at uh, the steep zones, they are represented in reds and pinks. And as you go towards the flatter side, it goes towards the greens and blues. So you have cooler colors. But this is mainly the uh, keratometry map that we are talking about at the moment. Now again, in the color schemes, there are two color schemes. One is the absolute scale and the other one is the normalized scale. So in absolute scale, it is a fixed color, uh, color coding system for that particular instrument. Okay, so it's always the same colors which will re uh, represent the same keratometric values and the same dioptric steps. And these steps are usually in large increments. So the disadvantage is that because there are large increments, if there's a subtle change, say from 38 diopters to 39 diopters, it is very easily missed unless it has crossed that particular step and gone into the other color, color range. And this uh, is overcome by a normalized scale, this disadvantage. So in normalized scale, there is a different scale for each map. So what the system is usually doing is it is just taking a look at all the keratometry values and then it will by itself divide it from minimum to maximum values and then the range of colors is distributed. So the steps of increments are smaller. So subtle changes are usually picked up quickly. So if you look at this image that I've shown, it's uh, the quality is not too great, but if you look at these two images, it is the same map, but the color coding scale is different. So you can we can just make out how much difference is there in terms of the number of colors that are used and the keratometry va values that are highlighted. Then what are keratometry maps? So there are four different kinds of maps which are usually uh, uh, depicted in a quad map, in a regular map, topography map. First is your keratometry map, which I'll explain now. Then you have two elevation maps. One is the anterior elevation map, one is your posterior elevation map, and then you have the thickness map, okay? So what are the keratometry maps? They measure the curvature of the circle that touch that particular point of interest. So when you get the curvature of that particular point, that is your keratometry map. And there are usually two types. One is your axial keratometry and one is your tangential keratometry. So there are two kinds of keratometry maps. In axial keratometry map, this is the one which we more commonly use. It is also referred to as a sagittal map. It is usually on your top left in your quad map. It is measured from the optical axis. So there is one optical axis and the points of curvature are measured from that particular uh, taking that optical axis as your reference. It usually provides an average of the curvature values. So if you see in this example also, it has taken up the average of all the values and very nicely missed this small little steep area or small little bump that the cornea has because it is just going to ignore that. It will take a average of most of the values. So it gives you a good estimate of the overall shape, but it will always ignore the minor curvature changes in a cornea. This is again overcome in a tangential keratometry map because it is independent of reference axis. And the tangents are at the point of interest. So it will uh, take this steep area also into account and will measure it separately and give you an accurate keratometry value in irregular areas as well. So it more closely represents the actual curvature of the cornea and it is very sensitive to focal abnormalities as well. Most commonly used in diagnosis of ectasias and assessment of refractive surgery candidates where you want to look at all the points um, and surgical induced changes and also in contact lens fittings. Now based on keratometry maps, there are different kinds of topography patterns. So uh, one is a regular cornea, then steep cornea, then you have something like a superior steepening, then you have inferior steepening, and irregular cornea such as in cases of corneal scars, and then symmetric bow tie appearance. This is a symmetric bow tie, but the radial axis is skewed, so it's not exactly um, 180 degrees. Then this is an asymmetric bow tie with an inferior steepening. Then this is a, a asymmetric bow tie with a superior steepening, and asymmetric bow tie with a skewed radial axis, which is very commonly seen in uh, cases of keratoconus. Now what is with the rule astigmatism and against the rule astigmatism? So when vertical meridian is more curved than the horizontal, we call it as with the rule astigmatism. So this is how the topography picture will appear where you have uh, usually a symmetric bow tie, hopefully, in the vertical meridian. Then you say that it is a with the rule astigmatism. And when you have 
a steep uh, axis in the horizontal meridian, then it is a against the Rule astigmatism. Then coming to the concept of best fit sphere. So best fit sphere is to be understood before understanding elevation maps. So after keratometry maps are the anterior and posterior elevation maps on your right side. So right side top is usually anterior elevation, right side bottom is your posterior elevation. So that usually is based on a concept of reference sphere or a reference surface. So what is a reference surface? If you look at this particular image, then you'll see all those mountains there, there is a, Oh, I'm just, sorry, I'm realizing my cursor is not coming there. Okay, sorry. So, um, for example, the first mountain is like a high elevation and the last one we are saying low elevation. But the elevation is in relation to what? In relation to the sea level. So the sea level is a reference surface there and based on the, refer uh, on the sea level, one is a low elevation, other one is a higher elevation. So same thing is, in topography. So for example, if you look at that yellow line, that yellow line is your tissue of interest. So your system is going to calculate a reference surface, which is called as the best fit sphere, which is the green line that you see. And based on that reference sphere, whether your points on the cornea are above or below that reference surface is what is calculated. If it is above, then it will come as elevation. If it is below, then it will come as a depressed area. So that is what is important. So again, there is a color coding representation for that. If it is anterior to the reference surface, then it is represented in warmer colors. If it is posterior to the reference surface, then it goes towards the bluer or the cooler colors. Green is usually at the level of the reference surface. Now, how a normal cornea will look like in an anterior floor? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, how a normal cornea will look like in an anterior floor. So normal cornea shape is prolate, which means it will be very steep in the center and it will flatten as it goes towards the periphery. So there will be a central hill. The blue area is representing the reference surface. So if there is a central steepening, then the central uh, steep area will appear as an elevated area. So you will have the plus points here. So it's an elevated area from here. Then when you go towards the periphery, it will dip down under the reference surface. So you have like an annular C, which shows as an area of depression under the reference surface. So you see that. And then you have annular C. And then you have peripheral highlands there. This, these are the peripheral highlands. Because again, it is going to go above the reference sphere. So you have a central hill. Then you have an area of depression under the reference surface. And then again, you have peripheral uh, elevated areas. So that is a normal cornea of how it appears in an elevation map. And a regular astigmatic cornea is toric. So vertical meridian normally would be steeper uh, than the horizontal, for example. So you have the steeper meridian, which will go under the surface. And the flatter meridian will go above the reference surface. And there would be a central saddle where they coincide with the reference surface. So now just looking at how to interpret a map. So in a pentacam map or a topography map, this is a shine plug imaging. So you again have all the four maps that I spoke about. On the left hand side, there is a column which gives you absolute values of all the keratometry and pachymetry data and other things. First thing you look at is quality specification. So if it says OK, that means this map is well centered and all the data points were adequately captured. Then you look at the absolute keratometry values, whether they fall within the normal range. K1 is usually flat, K2 is the steep, Km is K mean. And then it gives you the astigmatism. Those are the basic things that you would look at. Then you look at whether the pachymetry values are fine. There is also a K max, which gives you the maximum keratometry value of that particular cornea, which again is important in terms of ectasias. And then there are four maps. So first is your axial curvature or sagittal curvature. Then you have anterior elevation map, posterior elevation map, and the pachymetric map. So these kind of four maps are given to you to analyze how the relation between anterior and posterior surface of the cornea is. Now what are your red flag signs which tell you that this particular cornea is not normal? So first is if you have extremes of keratometry values. Second is how is the pattern of steepening. If the keratometry values are, uh, are exceeding the normal limits, how is the pattern? If it is asymmetric steepening, uh, then it represents an abnormal pattern. 
Then again, thickness values. So if there is a difference between the thinnest location and the pachymetry at apex of more than 10 microns, then it is usually suspicious. And in thickness map, you should also look at the displacement of the thinnest location. So normally in a normal cornea, the thinnest location would be in and around the apex. But if it is an ictatic cornea, the thinnest location would be shifting elsewhere. So if there is, say, an inferotemporal displacement of the thinnest location, you know that this is a ictasia and a focal weakening is happening there. So the point, point of thinnest location, abnormal posterior or anterior elevation, and steepest keratometry, if they are coinciding, then it is highly suggestive of a keratoconic cornea. These are your normal cutoffs, which I've put. So if it is less than 12 in the anterior elevation and less than 16, then it is usually considered normal. 12 to 15 and 17 to 22 respectively are for keratoconus suspects. And if it is more than 15 and more than 22, then you have a definite case of keratoconus on your elevation maps, this is. So again, looking at an example of red flag signs, this is a, uh, um, this is a topography map. We can see that the quality specification is okay. Keratometry values are extremely high, which is going into 50s. There is an inferior irregular steepening that we are seeing. So it's not a symmetric bow tie that we are seeing. There is an anterior elevation of more than 12, definitely. It's going into the 20s and 30s. Posterior elevation has gone up to 68, so it is definitely more than 70. And then it is also coinciding with the thinnest pachymetry point. So the thinnest location is coinciding with the steep area and the elevation points as well. So this is the thinnest point, this is your steep area, and it is coinciding with the elevation point. So this is a definitely focal weakening and focal ictasia happening, so more suggestive of keratoconus. So now looking at some examples, again, this is a quad map. We can see that the, anti, uh, the keratometry map shows fairly uh, regular uh, distribution of keratometry values. It is around 45s. Then there is no abnormal anterior elevation. We don't see any abnormal posterior elevation anywhere here. And the thickness map does not show any abnormally, abnormally thin point. So this is a normal map. Okay, There's no problem with this map. Now this is a second example. Here we have a steep cornea, the symmetric bow tie appearance is what we call this. So symmetric bow tie appearance in the vertical meridian. There's no abnormal anterior elevation, no abnormal posterior elevation, no abnormal thinning on the pachymetry map. So this is just a steep cornea, but there is no ictasia. So this is just an astigmatism or a steep cornea. Now when we come to this third example, here we do have some asymmetry. If you see here what we call as the teardrop sign, so there is the inferior asymmetric steepening as compared to the superior steepening. There is anterior elevation here up to 32, posterior elevation and area of thinning which is clearly displaced from the central point and the elevation, the thinning and the steepening is coinciding. So this is a focal area of weakness causing steepening more suggestive of a keratoconic cornea. Again, this, is, this also shows a, a asymmetric steepening here, elevations and coinciding point of thinning. So again, keratoconus. This is more like a spot diagnosis, what we call as the kissing pigeon sign or the crab claw appearance in a PMCD. So here you have a kissing pigeon sign, you have peripheral elevations and thinning is usually not picked up very well on these topography maps because the thinned out area is quite peripheral and is not picked up in the 8 to 8.5 millimeters that the pentacam picks up. So this is a pellucid marginal degeneration, okay? And this is again the classic butterfly wing sign that you see in a PMCD. So this again is a pellucid marginal degeneration. The keratometry, uh, sorry, yeah. The keratometry map will show this butterfly wing sign here. So you have crab claw appearance in the previous map, and you had the butterfly wing sign in the in this map that you are seeing. Rashmi, uh, you would like to cover both the topics, or you will? I'll be covering uh, ocular surface basic tests. Sir. No, you have around five to seven minutes more. That's why I said. Yeah. So after examples, topography is done, okay. and then the main tests is what I am covering for Dr. Soham Basar. So. Okay. And again, then this one, this one, this map has a flattened keratometry uh, map, if you see. So there's a flattening here, but there is no elevation on either of the maps. And then there is a corresponding thinning. 
So this is an example of a post-refractive surgery cornea because it has been ablated. So it will become flat and it will be depressed and it will be thinned out. So what are the uses of topography? It helps in differentiating the normal astigmatism from ictatic disorders, diagnosing ictasias, also monitoring the progression of ictatic diseases, screening before refractive surgeries, whether there are any abnormal ictatic problems, and also a supplement to biometry to look at the corneal astigmatisms.